I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, that's usually right in the middle of your Bible, Psalm 107. Psalm 107. And I'm going to start reading there at verse 23, down through verse 31. Psalm 107, and beginning at verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord, and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth, and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul melteth because of trouble. They reel to and fro, and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits' end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they are quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. O oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. If an artist were to paint a picture of this text, you would see a damaged and a beaten ship, maybe the sail or part of the sail ripped or missing, that had just come through a very devastating and a troublesome storm at sea. And yet the ship would be positioned in a harbor, safe and peaceful, away from the storm. I call this sermon a desired haven, taken from the words of verse 30. Haven means a place of safety and security, like a small port or harbor or an inlet away from the violence of the sea uh, at large. And it's related to our word heaven. They both come from the same Old English root. And it's a desired haven because that's where you want to be. It really is. In the literal sense, if you're out at sea and you have a boat that's having engine trouble and there's a storm pressing coming on your way, uh, you start to get a little bit panicky. Or in the figurative uh, spiritual sense, when your life has storms and problems that seem to want to overwhelm you. Verse 26 said their soul melteth because of trouble. In those times, you want to be someplace where the storms can't touch you anymore, and the, the, the ship of your life is at rest. It's at peace once again. Nobody wants to be bombarded constantly with trouble and bad experiences, bad circumstances. If you do, you're a weirdo. But on the sea of life, you can experience some real difficult storms, some real difficult problems. Unlike the TV preachers, we know there are more than just financial storms, dear prayer partners, tuck in your love gift. We know there's a lot more than just financial troubles. You can have family trouble that you think no one else has ever had family problems like mine. You can have your husband, you can have your wife suddenly decide to leave you or to step out on you. You can have grown children, but for some reason they don't want anything to do with you anymore. They don't speak to you anymore. You can suffer a major physical or medical storm that just about wipes you out. You can end up without any true friends. You can end up without any place to live. That happens to a lot of people these days. Sometimes financial storms are the least of your worries. It doesn't seem like it at the time. I understand that. But all of, all of those storms have one thing in common. You will never get safely to the other side of that storm to a safe haven without the right captain steering your ship. Amen. And the believer has the right captain at the helm. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the captain of your salvation. Hebrews 2, verse 10. 
Uh, he's never failed. He's never disappointed anyone. Whoever put their trust in him, whoever put their hope and their confidence in him. He'll steer you through troubled waters and a stormy sea and get you safely to the other side of that problem uh, like no other influence, no other force or effect can. Jesus said, ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. John 13, verse 13. Master means he's your chief, he's your commander, he's your ruler. In Mark 6, verse 45, we read Jesus, quote, constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. Verse 47, and when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. But a storm came up uh, on the sea, and the wind began to blow and knock the disciples around in that ship. And then verse 48 tells us, about the fourth watch of the night, that would have been 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., that's the fourth watch. He cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. They screamed. You had twelve grown men on that ship about to pee their pants. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. That's why I said, you need the right captain. When traveling through the, uh, to the other side of the life God has for you, on the other side of the storm, on the other side of the problem, on the other side of the circumstance, the other side of the difficulties, you're going to be faced with all kinds of problems along the way. You see your destination. You see where you want to go. But getting from here to there might mean traveling through some choppy water. Every heartache that ever comes your way can bring a lot of pain. However, in the end, it might be a blessing in disguise. We don't think of it that way. We don't want to give up anything we're enjoying right now. We never want to say, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe this isn't a good testimony as a believer. Maybe this is not what, I, what the Lord Jesus Christ would be doing if he were here right now in the flesh. So why are you doing it? Why are you going there? Why are you saying it? Why are you talking that way? Why are you spending your time with those kinds of people? Why are you doing any number of things that don't reflect well on the Lord Jesus Christ? But you, you begin to grow as a Christian. You realize, if this is not becoming of my Savior, then maybe I shouldn't be doing it. It hurts at first to give it up and say, I'm going to find something better to do with my time, with my energy with my mind than the things I was doing. The Lord knows all about you and your problems. He knows more about you than you know about you. We sometimes don't want to give the Lord credit, but he knows more about you than you do. He knows more about me than I could possibly know. And he knows what's better for me when I think I've got it all figured out and I know exactly what I want, he knows what's best. And uh, he uses several different ways to steer your ship through troubled waters, through the storms of life. I want to consider those things today to get you to a desired haven. First of all, he steers your ship by his spirit. John 6 verse 63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Things that are physical, tangible, have no a, a, a power to change anything in your spirit, to change you on the inside. That's why I say um, water baptism can never wash away the sin in your heart. Just joining a religion or joining a church doesn't mean your name is recorded in heaven by God. These outward things, while they may produce some temporary 
uh, improvement in you don't change anything in the light of eternity. You need Jesus Christ, and that can only be done by the Spirit. He told the woman at the well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, verse 24. The Bible says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8, verse 4. The Bible says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, verse 14. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8, verse 16. And John 16 Verse 13, the Lord Jesus said it was the Holy Spirit's job to remind you of what Jesus had said. He said the Holy Spirit would, quote, bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John 14, verse 26. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit's job is to remind you that you're saved and not let you forget it. Why would you want to forget something like that? Get on your deathbed, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Oh, I forgot, I did get saved about 35 years ago. <laughs> Haven't done anything for the Lord since then, but oh, I'm sure hope it's still good. I hope the warranty hasn't run out on that, you know? I don't understand the charismatics and the Pentecostals uh, who think that it's not permanent. I believe when God saves you, He knows what He's doing. He saves you for sure, for certain, and forever. And, and I don't understand these people are always looking for some verse in the Bible to try to prove that you can lose it if you're not careful. That doesn't sound like the work of the comforter. That doesn't sound like the one who's sent to bring consolation and hope and remind you what Jesus says and promises. That doesn't sound like the work of the Holy Spirit at all. That sounds like the workings of an unclean spirit. And there are a lot of saved people who have yielded their thinking and yielded themselves to the control of an unclean spirit. They're looking for something in the Bible to back up some crazy idea they had to begin with. I remember seeing a cartoon as showed a kid laying on the, on the floor in his living room looking over his Bible. Um, and his dad or mom asked him what he's doing. He said, I'm looking for a verse to back up one of my preconceived notions. That's how a lot of people go through the Bible. But the Holy Spirit's job is to remind you that you belong to Jesus Christ. And by the power, by the working, by the will of the Holy Ghost, God guides your ship. He steers you. He prompts your thinking. He prompts your conscience to, to either say it, speak up, do it now, or don't do it. Shut up. How many have ever heard the, the voice of God in your head say, shut up, don't say anything right now? I sure have. Just when you're about to join into that conversation at work, something inside you says, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Let it go by. Don't you get yourself involved. Boy, I'm so glad the Holy Spirit does that to me. I can't thank God enough for saving me from putting my foot in my mouth and shaming the Lord Jesus Christ yet again. But He, he steers you by His Spirit. Secondly, he steers your ship by His Word. By His Word. We read, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. Paul writes, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the Word of God which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. The only, you can hear the Bible preached, you can read the Bible, but the only way the word of God will ever work effectually and bear fruit in you is if you receive it as the word of God. You have to trust that God's word is true and dependable, and there's not a thing in there you need to doubt or worry about. Just believe it. I said to a guy one time, I saw him sitting in a restaurant looking over a Greek New Testament and trying to, trying to teach himself New Testament Greek by comparing that with, uh, I think he had the New Schofield Reference Bible. And so I played dumb, and I walked up to him, and I said, uh, what are you doing? He told me. And I said, let me ask you, do you think that, just 
a thought occurs to me. Do you suppose there's ever been a, an English Bible that the translators actually got right? Everything in it is completely right. It doesn't need to be changed any longer. Now all we have to do is believe it. And he thought for a few seconds, he says, I don't think there is a book like that. I do. I got a copy of it. I got several copies of it. But the Word of God, the Holy Bible, it reveals the mind of God. It reveals the will of God. It reveals the, the cause of sin. It reveals the plan of salvation. It reveals the doom of the wicked who die without the grace of God saving them one day. It's traveled more roads than any single man in the history of the world. If God wants his word to get into a country, there is not a government force or an army in the world that can keep it out. We've had missionaries we've supported in years past. I remember we had uh, one missionary, he had a bakery inside a, a communist nation. I'm not going to mention which one. I don't know if the Russians or the Ukrainians or somebody else are watching ours. <laughs> but we had a, a, a fellow who had a bakery inside uh, the borders of another country. And he would shove little scriptures in that language into the dough. And he was baking the word of God. <laughs> and people were picking up bread, taking it home. And they'd get the gospel when they cut into that loaf of bread. There's a guy named James White. He wanted to reach people in Cuba. He didn't know how to do it. So he tried to figure out, estimate the, the tides of the ocean from the coast of Florida over to Cuba. So he filled up hundreds of little flotation, uh, plastic flotation bags with gospel tracts in them. And, you know, he prayed and he launched hundreds of these into the water, hoping the tides would take some of them to the shores of Cuba. And a couple years later, he and a friend were flying a small aircraft in that area of the Gulf, and they had to make an emergency landing and in Cuba. They had some engine problems. They landed in Cuba. Of course, right away, they're uh, detained and taken to a jail. And he found men in the third level of lockup reading his tracks. To watch God work, do you realize in um, my Bible is printed in uh, China? I know the way the Lord works in these things. Don't you know there's somebody working at the printing plant or the printing company in China who's taking home copies of that King James Bible so he can practice his English at home? And he's learning the word of God along the way. If God wants it in, there's not a force in the world that can keep it out. Brother Andrew, uh, known as God's smuggler, he would go up to the, the border of Romania this, during the Cold War, old Volkswagen bug. You know, they had the engine in the back and the front end was a trunk. But uh, he had the front end filled with Bibles. He had the floorboard filled with Bibles, and then the little package tray in the back window, he had Bibles up there. He pulled up to the checkpoint, get his visa ready to show and so forth, passport, I should say, and said, Lord, in your word, you made blind eyes to see. I'm asking right now that you would make seeing eyes blind. The communist guards would inspect his car. They walk around, look in the window, lift the trunk, close, the, close it, and then pass him on through. They didn't seem to notice a single Bible in his car. And this happened more than once. That's how he got the nickname, God's Smuggler. So like I say, if God wants it to get in, there's not a force of man that can keep it out. And he steers men to a desired haven by his word. And I'm thankful that he does. But... Um, The Bible is a magnifying glass to help you see Jesus Christ more clearly. And if you've got a, if you've got a perfect Bible, then you're going to have a, a perfect picture of him. 
at least the best picture a uh, mortal man can deal with. But it's not, not only a magnifying glass to see God, it's like one of those magnifying mirrors. My mom used to take us to get shoes when we were little kids, and the shoe store had one of these little wavy mirrors, um, and it was kind of, it would magnify your body, you get up close to it, and your, your head's really small, but your feet are way out like this. And uh, so, it all, it, not only do you see Christ more clearly, it shows you yourself more clearly, more honestly, more truthfully. You realize you're not as good a person as you think you are. You're not as holy as you think you are. You're not as sanctified and set apart as you think you are. It magnifies your flaws and your faults and your uh, limitations and your sins. Like nothing else can do. Sometimes people won't tell you what you need to hear. But if you get your nose in the Bible, God, the Holy Spirit, by his word, can tell you what you need to hear and show you what, need, what you need to read. But God, uh, he leads the mind. He instructs the heart. He instructs the soul uh, to a desired haven by his word. Thirdly, let me say this. He steers us by his church. Turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, and start with me at verse 11. Verses 11 to 13. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. And all believers, wherever they are, whoever they are, constitute the body of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ here in the world. The New Testament church is likened to the human body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. All believers, regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of sex, regardless of language, regardless of culture or background, if they know Jesus Christ as the forgiver of their sins and the as Savior of their soul, they're part of the body of Jesus Christ. They constitute the bride of Jesus Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it can be a very marvelous thing when believers are in submission to the Savior who saved each one by the same blood. In the body, or the human body, every part has its function. It performs its duties. You might enjoy a good meal. It tastes good. You want a second helping of it. Goes down, still tastes good. About three or four hours later, you need to go to the bathroom. What if that part of your body didn't function? Well, that meal wouldn't have been as enjoyable as you thought it was. You need every function in the body to work and do its job so that you can continue day by day by day and enjoy the things God sends your way. Things that we don't see on the outside, we don't want to give credit to, but boy, I'm so glad that the processes of digestion, elimination, do what they're supposed to do, so you can enjoy another meal, uh, you know, a few hours later. In the human body, the smallest part can play a very, very big and a very important role in your life. Really can. Um, there's an equal and a proportionate share of the labor to each part of the body. And God knew exactly what he was doing when he designed the human body. They've studied the foot and all the muscles in the foot and the tendons and the, and the 
flexibleness or the flex of the foot, the arch, the toe, the, or the, the heel, the ball of the foot, the tendons of the behind the heel and the ankle, the tendons on top of the foot and the angle and the pitch and the balance of the toes and the weight. And they said there's very few things in all of, all of nature that are designed so perfectly and with such precision and dependability as the human foot and the toes. But we don't think of toes being that important to us. When you get up in the morning, you're looking in the mirror, you're considering, you're thinking about your face, are my teeth clean, and my hair combed, uh, do I smell okay? You know, you think of your underarms more than you think of your feet. But, but every part of the human body has its function, has its job, has its role to, uh, to play, to perform. And so should the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Find something that you are uniquely suited for, to do for the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ, and set about to do it. Ask other Christians who might know how to be, who can shed light on it to help you figure out what it is I can do for the Lord Jesus Christ. We speak about, rather, Galatians 6, verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. The church is made up of people, uh, and you cannot be a one-person church. And I know some of you watching our sermons on YouTube, watching our sermons every week, you haven't got a good church near where you live to go to. I feel for you. But find some other believer, someone else who has a similar conviction, who knows they're saved. Seek fellowship wherever you can find it. Sometimes you don't have perfect fellowship. So I've worked at places, the only people I had fellowship with were some Pentecostal preacher who said I wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit, but he's the only guy, other guy in the workplace that I knew was saved. He just didn't understand his Bible very well. And uh, so you, you, you get what you can from them sometimes. But you need to be with other believers. And they need to be with you. When we talk about the ministry of the church, we're not talking about being a member in a church. That's not the same thing. Membership in a church can't save you. And we don't mean the authority of some church or some church leader to tell you what it is you are supposed to believe, and what you're supposed to know, what you can do, what you can't do. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to bring understanding and conviction to you. It's not the job of any preacher. And uh, we mean the fellowship among believers in a local church. And this is where the work of the ministry gets done, in a local assembly. And it's part of the larger church worldwide. Your joys, your concerns, your sorrows, your blessings, your heartaches, all of those things can be brought to the brethren where you know someone cares about you and they're going to pray for you. And they depend on you to pray for them. When one suffers, all others suffer along with them. When one rejoices, the others rejoice with them as well. Think of it this way. I talked about the foot. You kick your bare toe against the furniture in the middle of the night. Your whole body's miserable until that foot feels better. It really is. You're walking at work with a limp the next day. But, but, you go and get a brand new pair of shoes. Hey! <laughs> Your whole body's got a little swagger now, right? It's funny how little shoe can, shoes can do that to you. Or, or pain can do the opposite, right? So when one member suffers, all the members suffer along with it. Or when one member rejoices, all the others rejoice. God uses the ministry of the church to lead and to guide you to your desired haven. You have Christians in a local assembly who want to look out for you, if you let them. Now, sometimes any one of us can be a little too nosy. Sometimes we put our nose where it doesn't belong. Sometimes we put our foot in our mouth, say the wrong thing. We can go a little too far. We can offend a brother or a sister. So we don't have perfect knowledge of what they're dealing with. We think we know enough. We think we can shed some advice, give some advice to them shed some light, 
It might be the worst, the stupidest thing you could do. You don't want to drive a brother or sister away. But you want to let them know you care. And if they're willing to open up to you and ask you to pray for them, let them know you pray. And talk to God. When, when no one else can help, God can help. So you and I need one another. Moses had Joshua as his minister. Uh, Elijah had Elisha. Paul had Timothy. The Lord Jesus Christ had the disciples. It's been said any man can be a success as long as he doesn't care who gets the credit. Everyone wants to be the top dog. Everyone wants to showcase themselves and get all the attention for themselves and say, well, yeah, these people help me, but they're not as important as I am. That's the wrong way to look at it. Wrong way to look at it. But God steers your ship, believe it or not, by his church. Lastly, I want you to consider the haven itself or the destination itself. It's a desired haven because there's safety there. There's shelter. There's joy there. In heaven, there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more headaches. There will be no more heartaches. There will be no more uh, worrying about your future. You'll have it all uh, under control by that time because it'll all be fully given to the control of the Lord Jesus Christ in eternity. Uh, in heaven one day, uh, you won't have any unearned, uh, unanswered questions that never seem to get an answer. You'll have perfect knowledge. The Bible says God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation 7, verse 17. The Apostle Paul didn't look at his impending death as something to be dreaded, to be feared. He said in one place, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far greater. You know, before a baby is born, the mother has been getting things together, setting up the nursery. She wants to eat healthy and exercise if that's necessary to help that child form and develop correctly inside the womb. And uh, as the time of the birth gets nearer, the baby's bed and the, the room has been set up. The nursery is ready to go. And uh, there may be a, a closet or a dresser already filled with clothes. And um, by the way, we didn't, uh, well, except for our youngest when we had an ultrasound uh, for medical reasons, we didn't figure out what the gender was or find out the gender before our kids were born. We wanted to be surprised. We like the surprise element of it. And uh, if that's the way God first started it out, then who am I to improve on that? Say, I want knowledge that God didn't tell me I could have. That was just us. But it, you do whatever you want if, if that you're in that case. But uh, if a mother goes to all that trouble to show that kind of care for that child, why would God show any less care for the one he's going to lead to heaven? He wants you to get there safe and sound. He wants you to get there successfully. Not get there like a ship beaten up and busted up and the sail uh, torn up and missing and uh, been battered all around. He wants you to get through and have cruised through that storm like was no trouble at all. You can only do that by the Spirit, by the Word, by the church and the fellowship of believers. And look forward to that desired haven. Verse 31 concluded in our text. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Yeah, oh, that they would. I wish they would. A lot of Christians don't praise him like they should. Don't thank him like they should. They don't show forth their gratitude and their thankfulness for all that they have and have received and, and are enjoying by God's kindness and goodness. 